First of all, I just wanted to thank you and South Western NRM for the opportunity to come out here. Um, second to that, to the landholders who are present here today because most of the information I'm talking about really comes from your properties. If I didn't have access to that property or to any of my colleagues from the government to come and research those sites, there would be no data to talk about. So um, it can't be valued enough. Those contacts are well before my time and someone young like myself coming onto those properties, it's vitally important that we respect that and maintain that relationship. Part of the role that I think I'm here to do today, the title that I was, was given was to have a look at some of the productivity benefits and some of the application of soil carbon in this carbon um, trading space. But just to give a bit of background from who I am and where I'm from, I'm based in Brisbane with a, um, a group that's called Soil Processes and it's a group that came out of the old Ag Chem laboratories. I don't know if anyone's ever sent some soils down to Indrapilly Laboratories for some fertility testing. Um, the lab was about from the late 1800s was established and it's now been rolling over and I'm part of a research group which just has a look at a range of different soil processes. So soil fertility, carbon and nutrient cycling and just today carbon is one aspect of the things that we're measuring in these laboratories. So I thought I'd break the talk up into a couple of sections, just revisiting how soil fits within that carbon cycle. What are some of the productivity benefits? And that's already been alluded to this morning by John by saying that carbon from a trading point of view has one value, but embedded underneath all of that is a whole range of other productivity benefits that you're already well aware of. It may just not be um, defined in the same language as what I'm using today. How they go about measuring and modeling carbon in the soil. And what are some of the um, applications for looking at that in southwest Queensland? Especially because a lot of the examples previously are in a cropping environment and you well know cropping is only marginal in some of these areas, most of which is raising of native or sown pastures. Beyond all of that is um, really putting a face to the name. Where can you find out more information about this? And I've got some cards here. I'm happy to give my um, phone number. If you want any of this posted out to you, if you prefer to have paper documents, not have it through the internet searches, I'll give you website links for all of it. Sometimes you can't access it in that method. I'm more than happy to post anything out that you might want more information for. And you're more than welcome to ring me at any time if you've got any particular questions. I don't have a face and a name on a website, but I'm here today and I can provide you with that information. I like this photo because it's a pretty picture. It gives the cycle of what's happening in a landscape and how that carbon is also cycled into the water. And so you heard earlier today that when you look at the land mass, you have plants and vegetation up the top here. These values in white show how much is stored. And then you can see how much is transferred down here into carbon in the soil. And so about two thirds of that carbon is actually stored in the soil in a terrestrial landscape. So this land landscape over here. A lot of it is stored in the deep ocean and sediments, but for your interests, most of the area you're concerned about is what's happening on your property and what's happening on your landscape. So the values that are given here in yellow are the processes that take place. In white down the bottom here is what is being stored and then what is being emitted here in red. This same information that you can view here is showing the same process. So this idea that you fix carbon, so carbon is coming from the atmosphere through photosynthesis in these plants and being stored into different parts of the plant. So you have what's in the vegetation, you also have what's below ground in the root systems, you have what is falling from those leaf material and being incorporated on the soil surface into the soil. Some of that gets washed off the surface or transferred underneath through the soil processes when it ends up in the, the streams and waterways. And you can see here it coming out to the rivers and then it exchanging. The interesting thing here is often when you talk about carbon, we just, we just use the term carbon, but from a soils point of view and from a, a vegetation point of view, the thing that really interests us is what the organic carbon part of that cycle is. And so in this system here, you have this inorganic carbon and organic carbon. And what we mean by that is the inorganic carbon is, an uh, easy way to think about it is limestone. So um, agricultural lime that you might apply in your paddock is inorganic carbon. But the area that most people are talking about when they're interested is what's coming in and out as vegetation inputs, for example, is this organic carbon. And so from now on, when I'm talking about soil carbon from the rest of this talk, I'll be talking about organic carbon. So we just saw this figure here. And what do we, what do we mean when we're talking about up here, this amount of carbon which is coming in as carbon dioxide, 
and being fixed into the soil in this system as organic carbon. So you've got here, give you, give you a tree, so you've got what's stored in the actual trunk of the tree. What's coming up here is the leaf material. It's falling down onto the ground and then incorporated into that soil. But the interesting thing from a soil's point of view is that previously a lot of the studies would say, oh, it's, it's the quality of the litter material. What kind of chemistry is in the litter? How quickly it breaks down and how quickly it moves into that soil space. But a lot of the thinking nowadays is it's a lot more complicated than that. It's actually about this little powerhouse down in the soil, these soil microbes. And the idea that this microbial activity, they produce all kinds of enzymes that break down this litter material, depends on how much moisture is in the soil, the temperature that's being operated under. So there's a whole lot of conditions that occur. And the easiest way to sort of think about that is lots of little cogs in the wheel, in the soil. And as they're each moving, these little microbes are moving, they're munching through all of the different um, materials, producing these enzymes. And as those microbes keep growing and moving, they're producing carbon dioxide through respiration. So they're losing some of that carbon and nitrogen in that process. So you have this carbon that's coming down into the system and into the soil. As it enters the soil, depending on those environmental conditions in that soil itself, these microbes are kicking over that carbon and nitrogen and some of it's getting released back out of that system. When you think about soil organic carbon, really it's just a measure and forms part of soil organic matter. And this has been happening for many years in your landscapes. You've been referring to how much organic matter you've got in your system. Carbon is just a part of that. So it's less than 10% of actual the mass of that soil, but it plays a really critical role, especially out here when you know you've got some of those finer textured soils. That surface soil can really make a difference to the productivity of your pastures, for example. And so it has a really critical role in, in how, how it's the physical and chemical and biological functions of those soils. So almost 60% of that organic matter exists as carbon. And so what you can do to get a measure of how much organic matter you have in your soil is you can me measure the concentration of that carbon in your soil. And then you can do a calculation to say, well, that's the proportion I have as organic matter in my soil. And so this is a nice diagram down here, Western Australian government produced showing that about 10% of that soil is living organic matter. Some of it is some of those fresh residues, and you can see here on the surface of this cracking clay, you get some of that fresh residue incorporated into the soil. About 65% of that is that humus, sort of that mid-turnover of soil, stuff that's really coming into that mineral matrix of that soil. And then there's a proportion of it, about 15% of that, which is resistant to microbial attacks. So it takes a long time for those microbes to break down that organic matter in the soil. It can be viewed as a function of what's coming into the system and what's exiting the system. And this isn't a new concept. Uh, this is a slide that um, my boss was using back in the 60s, the bucket, the bucket slide. So you've got this fresh input coming in, for example, as plant material. It comes into this soil and then you've got some functions that take place based on some of those environmental characteristics, the temperature, the moisture conditions, what microbes you've got in the soils, how active they are. And then you have some of that lost out of that system again as carbon dioxide. So another way of visualising that, you've got these plants and animals on the surface of your soil. They break down into the soil surface. Some of that gets decomposed and forms some of that organic matter in your soil. And then that organic matter of that soil starts to turn over by these microbes. And in doing so, you lose some of that as carbon dioxide. And then you have this soil that's fairly rapidly turning over here and some of that gets incorporated into the humus of that soil, which takes a little bit longer to process and to turn over. So when you're talking about carbon storage, that idea that you have some of these faster processes moving into some of those slower processes. And the idea of sequestering is bringing that fresh carbon from the atmosphere and storing it long-term in those soils. But it's not a neat system. There's always going to be areas of that system that have these open holes, and you can see that by that carbon dioxide which is coming out the side here. So it's a balance between the inputs and the outputs of that system. A way to kind of think about that is often we're talking about how much total carbon I have, and from a whole system, it's the carbon that's in the vegetation, in the soils, in the root systems. But just for the soil carbon, we can measure the total carbon content in the soil, or we can measure the different parts, and by that, um, there's been a lot of thinking around how rapidly carbon turns over in the soil. So you see here on the surface you have these fresh residues, what they call labile, 
but that is fast moving so you can gain those inputs quickly but you can lose them quickly as well. And then you start to come down into this sort of middle range system, the humus of the soil. We start to get incorporation of some of that fresh material into the more of the, the soil minerals. And as that gets incorporated, a portion of that is this very slow moving or resistant to breaking down what we often refer to as charcoal in those systems. But you do get a little bit of charcoal in all of that area because as you know, the particles break down and it gets incorporated differently. So when we measure it, from a soil's point of view, we often measure how much is the total carbon in the soil, but if we think of it as a pie chart, how much of that is in the humus, which is sort of fairly moderate turnover, how much is in the particulate, which turns over fairly quickly, and how much is in resistance, which takes a lot longer to turn over. And why do we care about that? Well, it has multiple functions. So from a carbon trading point of view, where we're looking at sequestering soil, it's important to know how long it's going to remain in that system and how long it will take for the microbes to break it down. But second to that, and from a land, land management point of view, people are already well and truly aware of it. They care about how, health, how healthy that soil is, how quickly those nutrients are being recycled in that soil, and you can tell that whether or not you're getting past your rundown or if you've got things happening there, a lot of that is a reflection of the quality and the condition of that soil. So one of the questions was, what are the productivity benefits? This is a very generic slide that the United Nations Environment Program um, produced around soils. Um, I've just replaced it with some local soils here so we know we've got those cracking clays. There's a whole range of supporting services. So when you measure the carbon in the soil, you're really measuring the capacity of that soil to be productive. And when they say productive, they're not just thinking about carbon sequestration, although it's certainly a part of it, but they're caring about things like nutrient cycling, how much water is going to be released or retained, what kind of habitats are you forming there? How well is it degrading some of those complex chemicals in the soil? Regulatory services, so looking at carbon sequestration or some of these greenhouse gas emissions. But then the provision of services, which is um, what many of you are doing already, the production of food and fibre. But then some of these cultural services as well. And so they've created a really large definition to say what are some of these provisions. That's a great statement and it's a great overarching slide. The difficulty is saying, well, how does that actually influence you on your property out here? Another really complex way to show a very simple process where you've got carbon coming in. The part that I wanted to illustrate here in this diagram is that there's a whole range of services that carbon is used to measure. And one of the things that they talk about here is carbon storage. Also how much nutrients are being transformed and taken off from fodder, for example, if you're producing a product which is being removed from that system. But also some of these food, fibre, fuels, breeding stock and genetic information. And I think it was already touched on this morning that often when you're measuring carbon, you're not doing it in isolation. You might be getting better information about your herd management or better information about your nutrient supply to your, your crops. So it's, it's a really fundamental measure of a lot of the farming system practices you're already undertaking. So I guess, you know, thinking about productivity benefits, it's just improving an awareness of what you know about the physical, the biological and the chemical conditions in your own soils to maximise your production potential, but also your business capacity to respond to these changes in weather and climate. And it was already discussed this morning that weather is some of those shorter change patterns, whereas climate might be some of those longer pulse cycles that happen. So if I was thinking about that from a physical point of view, a lot of the literature has already brought this together from different products to do with soil health and soil quality, but carbon is a measure of all of those. So for this area, it might be looking at minimising the sodic or erosive soil losses, looking at soil sealing, maybe you can minimise that by improving the physical structure of your soils, salinity issues, maximising infiltration weights or those water holding capacities. Some of the biological and chemicals might be looking at how to get bio better biomass production from your native and sown pastures. How available are the nutrients in your soil? And phosphorus is a great one for that. We're a fairly phosphorus deficient soils in Australia. How to make that phosphorus available for use? Looking at the supply and turnover of those different nutrients and carbon is a signal for all of those. But also I think it's that response and resilience to those different systems, particularly when you get out, out here and you have longer drought and flood events and we're talking about the possibility of building an, an increased awareness to be resilient to those changes. So if we were looking in Australia's system, um, they, they broadly classify them into 14 different soil types in Australia. Um, and it's just reflecting those arid, strongly weathered natures. So 
Um, inherently, they've been weathered for a long period of time. They're generally low in soil phosphorus and some of the micronutrients in those soils. Uh, out in Western Queensland, the, the four major soils that are occurring out here and you're very familiar with, I just wanted to go back and visit some of those. So you've got those candor soils where the moulders are on, where you get this uh, shallow texture grading further. You tend to have low um, water holding capacity, low fertility in these soils. You might be getting irrigation required if you're wanting to get anything um, productive out of them. A little bit more friendly are those vertisols, those cracking clays, where you, um, you do have better potential for water holding capacity than a few others, although you've got to watch some of those issues with the gill guys and getting heavy water through those areas. Or these soda soils, those um, texture contrast soils that you get out here where you have a high erosive capacity because you can see here that top surface in the 50 centimetres, if you start, <clears throat> we were talking last night about different ploughing techniques and that idea that if you just happen to plough slightly differently, you, you remove some of that, you get this highly erosive surface soil, but then this fairly puggy subsoil and then you lose your productive capacity there. And carbon is a measure through all of these systems. And then these tenosols, which are less structured soils than something like the vertisols, and they may have a, risk, a high risk of erosion. So you have fairly fragile soils out in, out in this area, and Brisbane, where I'm based, often a lot of the cropping areas are working in these lovely vertisols and cracking clays, but head out west and you've got lower rainfall and lower soils. That surface soil is very important from a productive capacity, and I think many people out here are already measuring that carbon because it's a, it's a measure of how well their pasture is going to survive the next 12 months to a couple of years. So if we look at that from a soil organic carbon content, I guess Western Queensland, some of those soil types are more, more around this end compared to the higher end. But the general trend from this as you're going down with depth, so you've got the surface here down to bedrock, is that a lot of this soil organic carbon generally is contained in the top 30 centimetres. And you can see here you get this curve where the concentration becomes much lower as you go with depth. And so that's an issue when you have these um, light textured surface soils, if you start losing some of those surface soils, what you're losing here is a potential for carbon in those soils. And so you've, you've got to work very hard to either reduce that rate of loss or increase the amount of carbon coming into that system to build that concentration of carbon up again. And so there's um, a range of methods that soil scientists and others around the world have had to adopt to, to get a uniform depth. You know, are we talking about the same thing when we're measuring soil? Measuring soil in South Australia, we're measuring the same soils information as we're measuring up in Queensland. So one of the things that affects, oh, I'll just come back to this slide. When we talk about soil organic carbon content, you often talk about a concentration of carbon in soil. And I'll talk about some of those methods later, but one of the, the key methods is you can burn that soil. You can grind it down to a fine powder and burn it. And you're measuring the amount of carbon dioxide that comes off. And through that process, you can measure how much carbon you have as a percentage. But really, from a soil's point of view, when we're talking about carbon trading, they want to know about the volume of soil as well. And so they can do a calculation to take it from a concentration to a carbon stock value. It's a little bit more complicated, and it needs to have some measures around it, like bulk density, for example, or the, the volume of soil you're working with. But that's um, one of the challenges, I think, from a soil's point of view at the moment, is making sure everybody's speaking the same language and bringing some of maybe those economic language terms into where they're, they're dealing with from a carbon space. So the main things affecting soil carbon levels, these are the, the, the five main factors that they, they show to promote governing the formation of soils. So climate, temperature, rainfall, vapor pressure deficit, the type of vegetation, the soil texture and the type of clay you have. So clay, all clays aren't clays. Um, there, are, there are different properties in those clays that affect um, the exchangeability of the different um, cations uh, in those soil profiles. So how, how well those nutrients are exchanged depends on the type of clay you have. The topography, are you in a really slopey area like on the east coast where you have um, one paddock that might have a greater than 5% gradient on it or are you out somewhere where it's nice and flat and some of those processes are likely to differ and time. Um, are we talking about weather events or short-term events or are we talking millennia when we're talking about the formation of soils, especially because some of those soils have been taking hundreds of thousands of years to form. So they're, they're the five main factors, but then they interact with some of the more recent land use practices and change. And so it's that interaction of those two things which govern the soil organic carbon level. And that's when it becomes really interesting for um, the role. Uh, what I find interesting is, in a science point of view is how do you tease apart those factors? 
how do you how do you comfortably say that soil organic carbon is changing because of these conditions up here, or how are they changing due to the management that is being um, changed on, on top of that system as well? And so some of the examples I was looking um, here depends on, for example, um, land development, depending on whether or not you um, pile it all up and burn it or whether or not it's sitting on the surface. Of course, how much carbon is in that system and how it enters that system and leaves that system depends on the type of management that's taking place here. Just to, someone made a point earlier today about how applicable the data is to this area. Uh, there's a map up here of a soil's carbon map that was produced last year or published last year. Up here shows you the dots of where all the soil cores were collected and you can see that there's a concentration of those mostly around a lot of the cropping areas. But there is reasonable representation in southwest Queensland. How well that is for representing what's happening on your paddock, I'll leave that for you. But they produce these maps and I think that's one of the difficulties from a source point of view is an essence of scale. You know, how applicable is this overall information drilled down to what's happening on my paddock? And so this is a, a map of carbon. Um, we said that carbon can be either as a concentration or as a, as a volume, as a carbon stock. So in this system they're reporting carbon stock in tonnes per hectare, ranging from around 5 to 10 per hectare in the red here up to about 200 in the blue. And this is the, the distribution as it, as it stands, taking a baseline or a snapshot right now as a soil carbon map. So it's very costly to go out and sample an entire landscape. They have to do their best to join the dots and try to get some sort of continuous layer of what's going on. And so you can see here that um, I think it shows nicely the conditions that are, are present under Australian conditions. In the hot, drier areas, you tend to have lower carbon. In the cooler, wetter coastal areas, you tend to have higher carbon. But this is where the interesting question comes from an accounting point of view when you're looking at the land mass that that occupies. So you might have a very high concentration of carbon here and a very low concentration here. But if the land mass in which that occupies, a small change in carbon can be quite significant out in areas like this when you're talking about hundreds of thousands of hectares as opposed to hundreds of hectares. And I think that's an interesting question for rangelands that we still haven't quite got our head around, but that's what we've been trying to do at least while this carbon, um, carbon initiatives have been around. Australia generally has slightly lower carbon, and I guess when we're talking about carbon potential reaching sort of some natural capacity, but it does vary, and they're starting to get a much better picture now of how it does vary in that landscape. So that idea that um, was already put forward today around the different management practices and time. So we've just got an illustrative um, graph here where you have the amount of soil organic carbon up on this axis. And so over a long period of time, you have natural landscape processes forming and you get a vegetation and a certain build up of carbon to what we call an equilibrium level. And of course, that depends. This isn't a straight line. It'll be bumpy and all over the place. But let's say that this is an average and they get some understanding of how much that varies, you get some equilibrium levels. So let's say mulga pre-clearing over many uh, hundreds of years, thousands of years, sorry. You go up to this equilibrium level and the, the concept behind it is that you have some kind of land use or management change. And they've been able to measure, um, and I'll show you an example in a moment for cropping, where you change that system through whatever development practice you have, and it's not uniform, depends on how that development was undertaken and when it was undertaken. But you have the potential for loss of soil organic carbon as you have the removal of some of that vegetation and soil from that system. And so it needs to be matched with the same amount of input for that to remain in equilibrium. But we've had a change come through and we start here under cropping, you get this loss of soil organic carbon over time. And they've been able to measure that. But what they're also saying is that there is a potential to change it somewhere along that decay. So you could you could change your system. Maybe you want to introduce pasture cropping into that system, or maybe you want to move out of cropping because it's marginal anyway, you're not getting a good value return, you want to move towards something else. So there is potential to change that system. But the big factor here is time. Um, how many years it takes, but also the intersect of what, what um, climate cycle might be underway. Are you trying to take a change in the middle of a very heavy drought that you, you weren't forecasting for? or did it happen after the end of a good season and we were talking about your regenerative capacity might be higher under those years. But that was their thinking about it in, in terms of the, the soil organic carbon measurements. 
And so um, there were some measurements done in the 80s where they were having a look at this and these are two different soil types. So you've got a cracking clay here and you had one of those sandier, sandy loam soils down here. And this was the, they were able to measure in these long-term trials um, at the start of the trial and then 40 years later. And you can see that under the cracking clay soil, um, the organic carbon content, so starting at 2% of organic carbon, um, the concentration in that soil depleted quite a lot after about 40 years under cropping. But then the rate of that differed on the different soil types. So that question that it's not uniform, um, cropping under one soil will have a very different rate of loss or gain compared to cropping under a different type of soil. And so a lot of that thinking has been revisited again recently with the, the carbon farming initiatives. And um, there were some <clears throat> papers that came out about five years ago that were having a look at that system from a business point of view and saying, well, we know that there's this same curve and this drop-off that had been reported earlier in some of these long-term trials, but how do we deal with that in a business sense? If we're going from what we consider conventional management and we're looking to improved management, can we slow the rate of that carbon loss in that system? So it's not just about what gains we can add to that system, it's not a static point in time. If I clear that now, they're saying that after 40 years, I'm going to be continuously losing that carbon. And that's when it becomes difficult to try and measure because you're measuring what is being lost out of that system, but also measuring how much you need to add into that system. So some of the methods that they were looking at that time um, to reduce soil organic carbon loss or build that soil organic carbon uh, a lot of the focus was on cropping in that area because in this previous slide you saw quite a rate of loss. Under pastures there was a rate of loss but it may not be as severe or um, depends again on how that clearing was undertaken and how quickly pasture was put on that system. Combined with the weather at that time, did they get good pasture production rates? Were they able to get good continuous soil cover when they made that land use change? But some of the ideas that they were looking um, at were things like crop management. Could you enhance how the fertility of your soil, get better rotations, bring in some irrigation in these systems, or maybe remove some of these fallows? There was a big question of till versus no-till um, in these soils, um, stubble retention, some of the pasture managers, better ways to look at fertiliser management, um, grazing management. Some people were trying to introduce earthworms, looking at irrig uh, irrigation improved grass species and by this trying to have a look at um, the root production of these pasture species, also moved to, um, you would have known, 3Ps, productive perennial systems, and um, <clears throat> also the introduction of legumes into these systems and did that help reduce some of the rundown effects that they might be getting in some of these pastures. But also organic amendments, they tried to add in organic matter to these systems, so increasing the amount of carbon input or looking at converting some of that land, so <clears throat> when they were converting towards cropland and it was becoming marginal cropping lands and they weren't getting very productive outputs anyway, could they start to move some of that into pasture and by doing so could they be slowing the rate of carbon loss in the future or could they be bringing new carbon into that system that was lasting longer in that system. They also had a look at bioenergy crops, agroforestry, we had a project about 10 years ago looking at peanuts into pastures and then from pastures into forestry practices. So they were trialling these new ideas out, biochar and different land clearing methods. And we've just had a project recently in the Brigalow and I think one of the challenges that I found certainly was going through some of those old records and saying, well, how different were those land clearing methods even in one district? And a lot of that came down to opportunity costs. If they could get access to decent equipment to clear at that time, some of it was timing. They didn't have the forecasting strength that they might have had in the 60s compared to now. And some of them were saying when they cleared at that time, it just happened to coincide with the drought and they could see the dust blowing off on these systems and that's a lot of their surface soils going with those systems. And I think that's a, certainly a question from a carbon point of view which has been in debate for some years and has come back to the forefront again um, this year in the media, which is having a look at how you actually quantify carbon and loss, um, particularly through erosion. And so I just highlighted two that have certainly been of interest in the Charleville area over the years, wind erosion and rill and sheet erosion, and these are all from Queensland Government slides to do with the different types of erosion that occur in Queensland. Um, there were some interesting studies in the 80s uh, out at Charleville in, in Mulga where they were looking at um, cesium modelling and trying to get some sort of indication of the rate of loss. I was saying last night over the course of about 30 years, I, I thought it was five centimetres of soil that was lost, it's actually three um, in their study, three centimetres loss which may not sound like much, but when you saw some of those earlier slides when those um, very sandy soils, three centimetres of your soil loss is a hell of a lot of carbon and you might be 
getting down to um, some of those sodic subsoils and once you start one of these processes happening, it can take a long time to slow it down. So they do have an impact um, and people are well aware of them on their own properties. It just may not have been in the language of soil carbon that was being measured, but they certainly do when they're sending them off for fertility testing. Generally, they'll take a soil organic carbon measurement as well. I just wanted to talk about um, some of the recent interest in um, measuring soil carbon from a uh, research perspective. Uh, previously, people were going off, there are lots of different measurements that could be undertaken, and one of the challenges from a, a research point of view was, can you, are you comparing apples and apples? Um, I might be using this method over here to measure, this chemical method to measure carbon content. Someone over here might be using a physical measure to measure carbon content. If I've got two tonnes over here and two tonnes over here, are they really the same thing for comparing? And it was very confusing, um, and I, I still find it confusing, and I've only been studying it 15 years. It's been well before my time that carbon was being measured. They wanted to try and streamline some of that process and bring some understanding and common framework around it. And so um, we started a project in 2007 with Meat and Livestock Australia, and it was a, a project in grazing areas to say,